Hello, everyone. We're going to get started uh, tonight. Uh, it's so wonderful to see such a, uh, a large crowd here. Uh, of course, we have some late arrivals, so um, uh, please make room for them as they come in. Um, my name is Paul Roth. I'm the director here at the Ryerson Image Center. And uh, on behalf of the RIC and the School of Image Arts, uh, which has generally uh, agreed to host tonight's lecture uh, in one of their wonderful projection rooms, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, I first want to acknowledge the original peoples of the Dish with One Spoon territory, the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee. The Ryerson Image Center operates in this territory today, and we uh, accept our collective responsibility to the land that this building stands on. It's my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to tonight's lecture with Moira Davey. Um, Moira Davey is a Toronto-born artist, and she lives and works in New York. And she is also not, incidentally, uh, the winner of the 2018 Scotiabank Photography Award. Uh, congratulations once again to Moira Davey for that. Uh, I want to thank Scotiabank for their gener uh, generous sponsorship of this award, which has uh, now been in operation for several years, uh, which has done an enormous amount to, uh, to recognize Canadian photographers here in Canada and around the world in partnership um, in the last several years with the Ryerson Image Centre, which presents the exhibition. I hope you've seen it. If you haven't, it's open tonight until uh, 9 o'clock. We're keeping it open a bit late. Um, and then uh, also with Steidl, which publishes uh, the extraordinary books that accompany the award. Uh, this year's is no exception. It's an absolutely beautiful book uh, that is very appropriate to Moira's practice. Um, and uh, I can tell you that uh, Gerhard Steidl personally told me that it was his favorite one, which I'm very happy about. <laughs> uh, this book is available for sale down uh, in our shop. Uh, please make sure to take a look at it. Um, Sorry, it's a bit awkward because um, Moira's got like a, a battleship, battleship station up here. Um, because we are here tonight in the School of Image Arts, it seems really appropriate to me to recount Moira's pathway through education. So I hope you'll indulge me. Moira, I hope you'll indulge me. Um, she earned her BFA from Concordia University in Montreal in 1982 and her MFA from the University of California, San Diego in 1988, and in 1989, she attended the independent study program at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. As you all know, Moira is renowned internationally for her photographs, videos, writings, and artist books, and her work has become increasingly influential in recent years with a generation of photographers. She has been widely exhibited, and her work is included in many important museums and private collections, including those of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Tate Modern in London, England, and here in Canada, the Art Gallery of Ontario and the National Gallery of Canada. One important note before we begin, after Moira completes her lecture, I will come back up here and we will open up uh, the floor to questions for a Q&A. Um, please note, we will be providing a microphone for anyone that has a question, and that's because we're recording uh, tonight's lecture. We're recording it and uh, making it available subsequently. Uh, please wait for the microphone to arrive if you have a question, because we want to make sure that you are heard clearly on the recording and in the room. Additionally, I want to remind you, if you have not already, please mute your phones um, so that we don't hear what ringtone you love. Please join me in welcoming Moira Davey. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight um, to hear the talk. I'm really delighted to be here. This is a brand new PowerPoint. I'm giving it tonight for the first time. And it, uh, it does a couple, well, it's, yeah, it's aiming to do a couple of things. One is to, um, uh, kind of show a, a migration of ideas across forms, so how certain ideas um, get repeated or and taken up across writing, um, film, video, and photography. 
And then the other theme is about revisiting old work and and then um, uh, you know giving it uh, giving it new life via new forms, uh, reconfiguring um, old maybe kind of minor works um, via new techniques of uh, reproduction and dissemination. So those are two very broad themes that figure in the uh, in the presentation tonight. But they're Inevitably, I'm, I'm going to probably, well, okay, here's another thing. It's quite a long PowerPoint, and as I just mentioned, I'm doing it for the first time, which is exciting, but I probably have too much material to, um, to include in um, this evening. And I'm gonna try and strike a balance between droning on and on about things and kind of Clipping, clipping ideas and descriptions, um, making things you know too short. So we'll we'll see how it goes, and and hopefully I can, I can move through, uh, I can move through a good a good chunk of it and um, do justice to the work and the ideas. So I am going to I'm going to turn the lights right off. I like that. I like complete darkness. <laughs> and I think I can still read my notes here. So I'm going to start with these. This was um, a series of photographs that I did between 96 and 2000. And at the time, I, I just called it the bottle series. And I photographed empty whiskey bottles in, in my home and eventually decided to cap it at five years and put all of the, I ended up with 54 photographs and they made them into these grids. And these are tiny little prints that I made myself in my own dar dark room that I had in Hoboken, New Jersey at the time. And... Um, yeah, and so frame them as a grouping like this. 54 of these, these images. And that was the piece, basically. And what it was about, in, in my mind at least, it was about this idea of delineating a period of time through a form of consumption, which is you know, something that other artists have, have done before. Um, the one artist that really comes to mind is, and I don't really know how to pronounce his name, Macunus or Masunus. He was one of the Fluxus artists, I think. Masunus? Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, he did this. He did, well, he, d he didn't do this, but he, I remember seeing uh, at a big retrospective at MoMA, he had these plexi boxes with all the products he had, he had consumed in one year, all of the packaging in the plexi boxes, so like all of his medications, all of his um, food, you know, empty boxes, cereal boxes. And uh, I don't know, I thought, I thought it was totally fascinating to, you know, to look at this accumulation of um, consumption. So this is, uh, this is a much later piece. It's, um, uh, it's a big, big print, it's got all of the 54 bottles with a few more added, a few variants added just to make it uh, a complete grid. And it's, um, it's a poster, it's probably about 40 inches high. It was produced uh, here in Toronto by John Goodwin and Goodwater. And John was really fascinated by the bottle series, he also, Together, we made these um, large diptychs. Each one of these is probably about 30 inches high. And, um, and now, instead of being gelatin silver prints, these are inkjet prints. And the series also got renamed. It's now called Empties. And John also published a little book with each of the, each of the images uh, just you know, a very not an not an expensive printing at all, 
And so in this year, 2013, I wrote a text to, to go with it. And, and I had, you know, in the interim, I had started reading John, John Cheever. I was reading his diaries and, and his short stories. And uh, in the diaries, I came across this line. I, I can barely read it because it's so tiny here on the PowerPoint, but you guys can read it. By the 4th of July... What does it say? There you go. All right. Um, and yeah, I um, I love that he you know spoke about this idea as um, these these things in his garden the um, the flowers the 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 calendar of flowers gin. Uh, gin bottles and steak bones, just this accumulation of um, of garbage, basically, um, and uh, and how it, you know, in his mind, it kind of formed a calendar. And so, you know, these are th these little essays that that I write. That you know, it's very they're very short, and uh, I also write longer essays, but. Um, what else? I, I mentioned Mirandi here, and uh, um, uh, talk about inebriation. So yeah, different themes, and um, and then this was a different, uh, a new iteration where, you know, because I'd started making these folded photographs in in around uh, two thousand and nine. I decided to do the bottles as folded, mailed photographs also. And um, these were for a show in Germany. So there I used, uh, I used silver tape for the aluminum tape, actually, um, which I thought was, worked really nicely with the kind of reflective transparency of the glass. Here you see them installed in Germany. And then also this was uh, a show that just happened at LA MOCA. It was a show organized around the work of the painter and film critic Manny Farber. And it was around the theme of uh, termite art. Okay. So this is a second series. This is um, even earlier than than the empties. This uh, these are the co the Copperhead series uh, that began around 1989-1990, just when when I was in the Whitney program, as as Paul mentioned. And I was doing a lot of work about money. So I was photographing the Lincoln Head Penny, and I was also photographing paper money. So you know, finding with um, with a cop, you know, uh, a, a, a camera with a very uh, long macro lens on a copy stand, isolating these little vignettes on the ten dollar bill, which still in 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 the late eighties had this kind of nineteen scene from nineteen twenty nine with um, uh, that little whatever I don't know what model. Uh, Something like a Model T Ford, and um, and people, uh, pedestrians. This is the. It's one of the. I think it's the Treasury Building in in Washington. So I was isolating these um, these little scenes on money. I was doing the Copperheads. I also did this multiple with John Goodwin. He had um, he had a little. Um, uh, multiple series called Shark Editions, and we did this uh, money box. Where these are actually, these are the figures from the ten dollar bill in the car, as you can see, and they're made into tin types, and they fit into grooves in in that wooden box, and it's a box that's kind of based on the design of like a 19th century film holder that would hold um, wet film plates like um, collodion film plates, except, yeah, in this case it held the, the tintypes, and uh, there was a little text in that box as well, 
and it was sealed with a $10 bill that you had to cut through in, in order to open the box. So here's the copperheads again. And when I, um, when I first made them, I did 100 8, 8 by 10 prints. And, uh, and I really wanted to show them at my gallery, but my gallerist discouraged me. <laughs> he wasn't so into that piece. But he did show a lot of these larger copperheads. Uh, these are 24 inches high, and here you see a grid of them at a show that I did in, in Basel. I'll, I'll come back to the, the little eight by tens and, and the grid of 100 and what eventually became of that. Well, actually, we're getting, we're getting into that here. So I decided, yeah, I decided to revisit that piece. I had been collecting since 1990. I had continued to collect these really filthy, corroded, scratched pennies and decided to do another set of 100, but again, to do them in this, um, this new format that I'd, um, uh, that I'd been uh, working in, the folded, mailed photograph. And all that tape that you see, that's the tape that's used to seal the photograph, and, but it ends up forming this kind of abstract pattern on, on the surface, which, I discovered, you know, as I began to do this, um, I discovered that that was um, part that was happening and it, and it became part of the piece and I started to work with it, you know, very consciously. So these, these photographs were also made into a little book uh, here in Toronto again by Roger Bywater. And so this text is from 2010 and in here, you know, you can see that I mentioned the, um, you know, the Kwakutl and, and Haida practice of, of potlatch. I mentioned misers from the 18th century. What else do I talk about? I talk about a famous forger uh, at the, um, in the 19th century. And um, yeah, and a, Jew and, and a few other things. And, so again, another little mini essay, and you know, recently I came, I, I read Mont Montaigne's essays, some of them, uh, a, a few of them, because he wrote so many years ago, but recently I came upon a lovely um, thing that he said about the essay. He referred to it as a poetic march by leaps and skips, and I love that. I just, I think that's such a, uh, perfect, you know, it's it's such a muscular little sentence, and I think it really encaptures, uh, really um, captures the idea of the, sub, you know, the subjective essay, which was what he is famous for pioneering, I guess, for um, identifying the kind of personal subjective essay that, um, you know, just goes in, in all kinds of directions, and... Uh, and it's um, you know it's it's kind of a portrait of uh, of a mind at work, and uh, it's a lot about drift and derive and and um, and those sorts of ideas, and and that uh, is like very important to the video uh, and film the film works that I ended up making. So, yeah, here you see uh, this is a big piece. It's actually called E.M. Copperheads, and um, Edward Mapl Maplethorpe, the brother of Robert Maplethorpe, used to live in my building, and for years he'd been telling me he had uh, an incredible collection of really, um, really messed up pennies, and he knew about my work, and he really wanted me to photograph his pennies, so eventually I took a look at what he had, and it... Uh, it was truly incredible. And so I, I photographed it, and uh, there's 150. And here you see one of them. Um, all right, the next, um, there's a lot of video embedded in, in, into this PowerPoint, and, and that's um, 
kind of what makes it a bit long as well. But um, I'll just, you know, when I first, you know, started doing this work around money, I was, um, I was poor, I didn't have any money. And I was really interested in Freud's ideas around money and anality, money is shit, uh, um, you know, all the kind of, you know, scatological um, stuff around money. You know, it's, it's been a long time since I've read that stuff. I, I, at the time, I was fascinated by it, and I read a lot of the literature, especially the psychoanalytic literature. But, you know, Freud, and I'm probably, I'm probably really, um, well, you know, t to be just, you know, very crude and simple, Freud had, you know, Freud's idea, his first idea, was that, you know, for the infant, the feces was the first possession. And... And, and the infant or the small child could use her shit, you know, as uh, a kind of barter, like, you know, to withhold it, for instance, um, in, um, you know, awaiting, you know, some kind of, um, uh, some, some kind of uh, um, recompense. Uh, anyhow, that's, you know, I'm really boulderizing it, but... Um, that's kind of you know the, his his basic idea, and of course he went on to expand on it by finding all these instances in language and literature where money and shit are basically basically equated. And so in this video clip that you're going to see, oh, and one of the things, <laughs> so I made it's it's actually a Super 8 film that I made in 1990, and I had really yeah I had really wanted I was kind of surrounded by filmmakers. And I really wanted to make a film. And I had people to help me and loan me equipment. And, and so I wrote a script. And part of the idea was to really kind of go into some of these ideas from, from my reading and my research. Because almost everyone at the time saw my, my work about money and interpreted, interpreted it as being about the financial Collapse, like the one that happened right around then, around 1989, 1990, which I was, you know, I was barely cognizant of. I have to, I have to admit, being a bit of an ostrich. But everyone told me, oh, you know, isn't it too bad? You're just, you're just graduating, and now the art market is tanking, and so on. Um, so yeah, people thought the work was uh, was about. Um, about finance, where in fact for me it was really about psychology. And uh, so here is a clip from Hell Notes. It's a little bit embarrassing, but uh, uh, here we go. 80 feet below Nassau Street on the bedrock of Manhattan lies the largest accumulation of gold in the Western world. 11,000 tons of gold bars worth over a hundred billion are stored in one of the deepest basements of Manhattan. There are no doors into the gold vault. Entry is made through a narrow passageway cut in a delicately balanced steel cylinder that rotates in a 140 ton steel frame. When an international transaction is made, the bars of gold are physically moved from one country's locker to the other. American gold bars are usually rectangular, approximately the size and shape of a regular building brick. Occasionally, visitors may see bars that are slimmer than usual. These bars, nicknamed Hershey bars, result when an amount of gold too small to make a full bar is left in a smelter's crucible. This leftover metal must be cast into a separate bar, a Hershey bar.
too. Got about 70 bucks. In the unconscious, money and property are the symbolic equivalents of excrement. And that's because things, things, property and money and things in general are all equated, um, are all equated with that which is um, cast off from the body, that which is alien to the body. And this doesn't mean that money uh, has no worth, has no value. It actually it means the opposite. We value money because we value our shit. There you go. So that was it's about a it's about a thirty minute film, and it's um, it's on the monitor downstairs in the gallery. And I hadn't shown it. I think I had shown it once or twice around the time that I made it, and hardly, uh, never, in fact, since then. But um, I forgot how, anyhow, somebody got the idea to, we, we pulled, it, um, uh, pulled it out of storage and recut it a little bit, took out uh, even more egregious parts than what you just saw. And, um, Shortened it a tiny bit and um, began began to exhibit it with the the new the new copperhead. So these uh, this photo is from Porticus in Frankfurt, and uh, I had several hundred, like maybe six hundred, of the copperheads, the male copperheads, in the show. In that one grid in the corner, you can see there's a blank, and that's one of the very few photographs that didn't make it to its destination. It's, it's been, it's hardly ever happened in all of the hundreds and now probably thousands of these photographs that I've mailed. And here you see, uh, this is another museum in Germany. These are the, these were the 19, um, the 1943 steel pennies that were made during the war to, to save, save copper. Uh, for munitions. All right, so now um, now we're moving on to so this is um, this is a frame from Nigodes, which is playing in, in the theater downstairs. And um, you know, I'm actually this is uh, I, that is a tiny little poster from 1982 because I actually I had a show of these photographs at the Rivoli, which still exists on Queen Street in um, in Toronto, but it's it's part of um, it ended up in uh, in in this film De Godes, and it's a film in which I well one of the things that I do is I. I link, um, I find a way of telling stories about my sisters by linking them to um, my sisters and my mother, and I link them to uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, the 18th century uh, proto-feminist and um, radical, radical thinker and, and writer and um, um, uh, mother, uh, she, Died, died giving birth to uh, a baby who would grow up to become Mary Shelley. So I link you know, the lives of my siblings and my parents to their lives via this very simple kind of fabricated um, coincidence. It's just it's a simple device. Our stories and their stories all took place pretty much 200 years apart. So for instance, my sister Claire was born in 1959, and Mary Wollstonecraft was born in 1759, and on and on and on. There's all these um, these dates that, that kind of sync up like that across two, two centuries. So I made this film, and um, and I and I kind of weave together the stories of 
Wollstonecraft and her daughter Mary and uh, her daughter Fanny, Fanny Imlay, and their half-sister Claire Claremont, uh, all of whom were raised by William Godwin and his second wife. He was another very, very radical, radical thinker and writer and um, activist. And um, yeah, he ended up raising these, these three girls after Mary died uh, about seven days after, uh, after childbirth. And so all of these, these photographs, and some of them, again, are downstairs in the gallery. I use these photographs that I, I took in, I took around 1979, 1980, to, to, tell, to tell these stories. And the stories are all told in a kind of voiceover. But in fact, what I'm doing, and I'm going to show a clip right now, what I'm doing is I've, I've written an essay, one of these... Um, uh, poetic Marches um, by, by Leaps and Skips. I've written an essay and, um, and I've recorded it and I'm listening to it and kind of pacing around my apartment usually and reciting what I hear. So I think you'll get a sense in this clip here. All right, here we go. Mary Wollstonecraft, born in 1759, 10 years after Goethe, uh, after Goethe and 200 years before my sister Claire was wet and dry. She was a brilliant star in her firmament, a passionate early advocate of women's, children's, and human rights, and an enlightened defender of truth and justice, a radical. She went to Paris to witness the, re the revolution and lived to tell of the bloody terror of 1793. A woman with enormous intellectual capabilities and savoir faire, she supported herself and her largely helpless six siblings by writing. But she also suffered from depression and brokenhearted over the rejection by her lover, Gilbert Inlay, drank laudanum. In an attempt to revive her, he offered a mission of travel to Scandinavia on, a on an investigation of a murky business affair of his. Mary accepted she needed the money and hoped that this continued involvement with Emily might ensure a positive romantic outcome. In 1795, she set out on a dangerous ocean voyage with her two-year-old daughter, Fanny, and a French maid. Like Goethe on his travels to Italy, Wollstonecraft wrote letters to Imlay chronicling her observations and emotional responses to the landscape and peoples of Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Her heartbreak is softly intimated in the letters, but mostly she reflects and reports with a journalist's eye on the native customs, a feather bed so soft and deep it is like sinking into the grave. Children swaddled in heavy, insalubrious layers of flannel, airless homes heated with stoves instead of fires. And here, like Goethe, Mary invokes the odd concept of elasticity to talk about the air. Viewing the mummified remains of some nobles, she responds with characteristic indignation. She wrote, when I was shown these human petrifactions, I shrunk back with disgust and horror. Ashes to ashes, thought I, dust to dust. After her return home to England, Wollstonecraft composed the letters into an extremely well-received book titled Letters Written During a Short Residency in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. It was published in 1796, 200 years before the birth of my son, Barney. So, 
So I know that sounds really arbitrary to mention the birth of my son, um, but he he will come back later on in the film. He'll he'll make an appearance. So and that happens with all of these. Um, you know, there's just uh, something is dropped, a kind of um, a coincidence, and then um, maybe not taken up until uh, a later part of the film. I, uh, I've, I, I, um, I started going, I started visiting archives, and uh, um, it happened first in, in Italy, and, um, um, but I, I actually um, got to know about this incredible archive at the New York Public Library called the um, Shelley and His Circle at the, it's the Fortzheimer Collection, and it's um, tons of letters and diaries and manuscripts from that whole group of people, Wollstonecraft, uh, the Shelleys, Godwin, and um, wonderful uh, curator there let me um, go in and photograph from, from the letters and diaries. So this is, a, um, this is an assortment of, of photographs from, from the Fortzheimer and um, also they got turned into, into these, um, um, you know, mailed, mailed photographs. Um, all right, so here is another clip from um, the second video that I made in the Les Godes trilogy. It's called Hemlock Forest, and it takes up um, it was um, it was a piece that was commissioned by the Kunsthal, um, Bergen Kunsthal in Norway. So I decided that I would reread the Wollstonecraft letters from Scandinavia. I bought a new copy of the book. I read it again, and um, and that's you know that's kind of how the film started. But it um, it ended up getting kind of you know derailed and became a lot more about um, the filmmaker Chantal Ackerman, who died right um, at the moment um, when I was um, actually reshooting a scene from one of her films, uh, um, a subway shot from News, News From Home. But so in the film, you'll see that I, well, I hope you'll see that I revisit, I revisit um, Les Godes, and I think that's what this, um, this scene here is going to demonstrate a little bit, but I'm not 100% certain. A woman rabbi gives the eulogy for Chantal. She recounts an anecdote of you filming your last birthday party in hospital before finally putting down the camera and saying, no, now I must live life and not just film it. The trouble is, you can only live once you've filmed. That feeling of freedom and release comes only after you've worked very hard for it. Years after making Hotel Monterey, you remembered the feeling. You said, I can breathe. I'm really a, a filmmaker. <laughs> oh, it is. Look this video, watch this! Yes. Ah. Yes. Ah. A few years ago, Iman Issa wrote, watching Moira Davies' Les Godes, I had the feeling that I was confronted with more than just the work of an artist, a photographer, or a woman reflecting on her life and profession. Her often repeated eye didn't come across as the eye of a therapeutic self-portrait or the timid and humble eye of a self-reflexive gesture. Davy's eye felt more desperate, more like a last resort. Perhaps she has known for quite some time that this voice is one of the few, if not the only, with which it is still possible to speak. 
When I read Issa's description, in particular her use of the word desperate, I felt she'd put her finger on it. And I was impressed by her forthrightness in calling me out. I am still trying to parse the desperate eye of last resort and why it felt to her like the only viable one. Perhaps it's because it signals a risk is being taken. I was, in fact, frantic when I wrote parts of Les Godes. My body was breaking down. I peed in front of the ATM and machine. The raking light in the morning, the cold, the pervasive frostiness of French teachers, and the and the humiliation of mediocre report cards were being visited on Barney. Desperate has evolved. Now there's the vanity of self-preservation in the sense that if I push myself too hard, I become depleted, gaunt. What's the use of working oneself to death? But like most in my situation, I need to keep working to live and not just materially because I've come to realize I'll never find happiness in idle pleasure. That last bit is totally cribbed from, um, from Ibsen, actually. And so, yeah, so that, that piece, um, Hemlock Forest showed in Bergen, and along with it, uh, a lot of photographs, including uh, some of the original photographs from, from Les Godes, and then newer ones, um, newer ones uh, that were in Hemlock, and uh, also Jason Simon's incredible smoke pictures. There was a whole smoking theme, actually, that emerged in, in the show, um, Jason's picture is made from uh, Polaroid, uh, posit Polaroid negatives, posit negative positive film. And I had, um, I don't know if I have close-ups, but I had some 16 millimeter stills of myself smoking and my son photographed his good friend Eric smoking. Um, and here's Eric who I photographed. And now we're actually kind of jumping into something. Uh, these were not part of the Bergen show. These, these next photographs were part of a piece that, uh, uh, that I ended up making for, uh, for, for Documenta in Athens um, in 2017. And you'll see, you'll, you'll, you, you'll see them downstairs in the gallery, but... Um, uh, also made into folded and mailed or FedExed photographs. So I did, um, yeah, these are, these are just shot with, with a Hasselblad. And they, um, they end up in a third film that I'm going to, or at least I talk about them in a third film that I'm going to show you called Wedding Loop. These were photographs that I actually just made on my cell phone using um, just photographing the negatives and then flipping them, um, uh, flipping them, um, you know, via Photoshop uh, into positive images. So here's the piece more or less as it was shown uh, at Documenta. And... Um, it's called Portrait Landscape, and you know there, it has. It's kind of interesting the way it came about. When I was invited to to participate in Documenta, the the curators um, began by asking me, inviting me to Calcutta. In fact, um, Kolkata is the the modern name of the city, but um, a lot a lot of almost everyone in India calls, still calls it Calcutta, and so. I ended up calling it Calcutta, mostly. Um, so this is the story behind this piece. So I had been I had been invited there. It was an incredible opportunity. I had never been to India, 
and I just they asked me to come and be on you know on a, on a kind of panel, give a presentation. I ended up taking pictures there. I shot film there, and then I came back to New York, and I was trying to think of what you know what piece I would make for Documenta, and I have. Uh, I have a really, uh, I have a really good friend in New York who was actually one of my one of my professors at UCSD, and he's kind of grumpy. He's kind of a cranky guy. He said, you know, you know, why? What? What is it with these, you know, biennial people? You know, inviting artists to these far flung places that they have nothing to do with, and then asking them to make work for their, for their shows, and. Of course, no no curator at Documenta, uh, you know, ever suggested that I do anything. It was you know totally up to me what uh, what I would make. But and so and so my friend said, you know what, you know why don't you just take pictures of of your sisters? And he planted the idea and. Uh, and, uh, and so I was going to Montreal for a wedding. My niece, Caitlin, was getting married. And I brought my camera, my Hasselblad, which I hadn't used in quite some time. And it was, uh, I was pretty rusty. And the camera itself was pretty rusty and uh, sticky. But I brought it, and, and I persisted, and I... I took photographs of of my sisters um, in the build up to this this wedding, which ended up being a very fraught event. And I'm going to play a, a clip of a video uh, 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 in a little bit where I think I talk about that somewhat. Uh, so the wall ended up being uh, a combination of portraits. Of, uh, of my family, and then also portraits of my son and his close friends from, from middle and high school. And then I also, I did their names. I, I wrote their names in this kind of um, mock calligraphy using a grooved board that I had found in France that, to teach school children how to write. So it was, um, and of course, the, you know, the, the title portrait landscape plays on the idea of, of both of you know portraits and landscapes that are part of this piece as well as the um, just the orientation of the photographs all right so here is uh, here's a clip from wedding loop the third film in the trilogy on a guided tour of a colonial cemetery in Kolkata I stumble upon the grave of a Thomas Princep, and immediately remember his name's connection to 19th century photographer Julia Margaret Cameron. Related to her by marriage, the Princeps would figure amongst Cameron's favorite models. In particular, Julia Princep Jackson, who was Cameron's niece and the future mother of Virginia Woolf. It's been years since I've looked at Cameron's portraits, the Victorian men, women, and children who sat for her in her converted chicken coop studio, her glass house on the Isle of Wight. But at the end of her life, ill and impoverished, she had little choice but to return to this hot, humid subcontinent of her birth, where she settled on her husband's coffee plantation and continued with the same unwieldy view camera to make portraits. By then, she had given up on the commercial potential of her portfolios. She focused instead on what was at hand. And then after that, Bhagavad Gita was translated. Great, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. 1,794. I photographed Jane in her wedding dress in the backyard and Claire in her T-shirt dress posing with Emma in front of the white brick wall. Addie, to my surprise, 
joins the group and allows me to take her picture. Jane unwisely has been at the hair and makeup party since morning. She is beginning to unravel. My mother's sense of foreboding in the buildup to the event was not misplaced. Her house is packed with visitors and dogs. Addie is more savage than ever. Annie is boycotting because Claire is attending. Kate implodes at the last minute and refuses to get into a cab that will take us to the celebration in the suburbs. The demand to be public and social over an afternoon and an evening at a ceremony and a dinner with 150 people, most of them drinking, is too much for this group of women. Women, my sisters and their daughters who are worn out physically and emotionally, are reticent by nature and are trying to abstain. and her spouse Antoine give vows that are funny and original. They are straight shooters. Not a single cliche is spoken. Addie dances. She is a beautiful girl and a beautiful dancer, but when she's not on the dance floor, she sits by herself and stares into space. I'm sure the pictures I've taken earlier with the Hasselblad or mediocre. The light was flat. My subjects were posed. I have no business hauling out this difficult to focus camera and trying to revisit something I did also only possibly well 35 years ago. So in the film, I go on to talk about how um, you know, there's all this drama, there's all this, um, this, this unhappiness, and, um, and how, you know, I'm just kind of there with my camera and, um, and you know, just kind of obsessed, you know, um, with this idea of, of my pictures and my film and getting home to the lab and so on. Uh, it's not... It's not a very pretty self-portrait, I have to say. <laughs> but at least it's honest. Um, okay, so these, and uh, yeah, you saw the shots on the subway, which is something that I've done quite a bit in. You know, several of my films uh, feature uh, either photographs of the subway or actual um, film, uh, film shots, and um, um, yeah, so now, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out my uh, chronology here. Um, well, this is, this is the piece called Subway Riders, and it um, contours a, you know, a big part of the gallery downstairs. It was, um, I had wanted to photograph people riding on the subway for a long time, but I had not done this kind of street photography in decades. It was a kind of, you know, category of photography that I had pretty much made off limits to myself, but was, you know, more and more um, wanting to do it and but extremely feeling extremely trepidatious about it anyhow it 
it, um, it came about because I got an invitation to be in a show about the Austrian writer Robert Walser, who made these um, uh, microscripts, who wrote stories in this, um, this old um, German language. It, it was thought to be meaningless for years until it was eventually deciphered, and, and he was in, a, in an asylum at that point, but um, his, 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 someone was able to decode the story. So it was a show in Chicago at Donald Young's gallery. I was asked to make a, a work in response to the writing of Walser. He wrote uh, novels and mostly short stories. But I decided to actually kind of take my cue from the microscripts, and that was my excuse to finally get on the subway with a point-and-shoot camera and take these pictures of, uh, of people writing, often in, you know, in tiny little notebooks. And so here you see, um, here you see some examples from from that series. I showed them initially in, in grids like this. I did, um, I did three grids of 25, and then I did, I did um, a larger grouping. And, and the line is, I think the line is kind of my preferred way of showing them because you can, I think there's just, there's so much detail in these, these pictures. There's so much that is picked up by by the camera, by the lens that I wasn't even aware of at the time because I was so focused on getting the shots of, of the subway riders. But then when you look at, look at the, the pictures closely, you can, um, you know, you can see all of this, um, all of this other um, information about city life and street life and just people looking, looking at people. Um, you know, I'm wondering, it's 8 o'clock, uh, I could go on, we're at number 52 of 77, uh, <laughs> or this might be a place to stop. Um, does somebody want to give me a cue from the audience? Paul, what do you think? <laughs> uh, all right, well, I have... Um, <laughs> Maybe I can try and make this really fast. We're moving into uh, a work that I did that was largely organized around reading the French author, uh, no novelist, mostly Jean Genet. Uh, this is uh, uh, a, good, a friend of mine reading him on the subway. Um, again, I made uh, photographs and turned them into uh, mailed, uh, mailed works. I, you know, I came to Genet, and actually you'll see when I play the video clip, I think it explains exactly how I came to Genet. So maybe I won't say anything, I'll just, I'll just kind of go quickly to the video clip. But I, I um, so yeah, let me go to the video clip and then Perhaps I'll come back to these slides and I can tell you more about like the ambivalence that I had around Genet. I was drawn to him very specifically because of um, one anecdote that a friend uh, recounted about him and that set me on this whole course of reading him for a year or two and making this film which is called My Saints and um, let me just hit play and see, see what we get here. I think I have to, okay, here we go.
A part of me wants to see writing or reading as personal and private and pleasurable without activating it in any strategic way. Not everything we do is for art making or writing for public consumption. I think back to an interview I heard with Janet that to deepen your practice, it's not just by studying writing, but it's actually the other bits, music, film, theater, and other things that interlock and just move you up a notch or two. Yeah, so in, in Thief's journal, uh, Janet recounts the story of um, stealing money from a, um, a fellow soldier when he was in the army and hiding it in a crack in the wall and then uh, kind of um, hanging back and watching this guy frantically search in his mess kit and, and all these like you know crazy, unlikely places for the money and the kind of pleasure that that Genet took in this sort of sadistic pleasure he took in watching this guy's, um, uh, you know, panic over uh, losing his money. And he even says something like, um, you know, you look like you're about to, uh, you know, you look like you've got the runs. Why don't you, like, go, go to the toilet and take a shit or something like that? Um, so... Um, that's what, you know, it was, it was my friend Pradeep at a public event quoting Janet from an essay that he wrote. Um, and the essay is in this wonderful, wonderful collection of Janet's nonfiction. And, it, and so in that film clip, you see Pradeep is like reenacting what he said at the, at the public event. And, and um, I ended up... Uh, I wrote um, I wrote another I wrote another essay that's you know kind of circle, circling around a lot of of Genet's ideas, but also um, a lot of a lot of very subjective material as well. And you know, addiction is something that comes up over and over again in in my films and my writing. And um, yeah, you could even in in the 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 section from Lego Des was about um, uh, you know Wollstonecraft's um, well anyhow I guess I won't go into the whole thing about laudanum and, and opiate opi op op opium from from that period but um, I do I do actually make that link between you know the um, 
the consumption of, of laudanum in the um, 18th and 19th century, and then opioids in the 21st century. And that happens in, in Wedding Loop. Uh, so I made, uh, I made the film, My Saints, I made that little book, my diaries, um, my Burn the Diaries, it's called Burn the Diaries. And these are some of the photographs from it. I'm moving rather quickly here. Uh, my very good friend, um, Alison Strayer, wrote for that book as well. And, you know, just to show you, okay, that scene where you saw, uh, that was my son Barney, you know, hiding money in a book and then coming back to discover that it's gone is actually from an Eric, uh, Ro Eric Romare film, uh, My Night at Maud's, where someone, um, one of the characters does that. He, he, hides, um, he hides money in a book and uh, um, it's discovered by one of his friends and taken and something, I forget what else happens, but the guy, the kind of, the guy who doesn't want to lend money, he, yeah, he's caught, he's caught lying. He lies, he says, my car, my car broke down, I can't lend you 100 or 200 francs. And um, these are just film stills from the Romare film. Um, and then he's kind of exposed as being like, you know, as being a cheapskate, you know, you know someone who had the money to lend but didn't want to lend it. Um, and that's all, that all, of course, gets back to Freud's ideas around money and anality and stinginess and, uh, and so on. So, yeah, you can see how these ideas are kind of, these ideas stick around um, over the years. Um, where else can I go? These are just more uh, images from that work. Okay, you know what? I think I am, I'm gonna stop here because um, the, next, uh, the next little bit is just about oozing wall and that's kind of a whole other kettle of fish. And I don't think I have the energy to go there to be quite frank. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to. So just a reminder that we have um, uh, time for some Q&A now, a few minutes, about 15 minutes. We've got a couple of microphones that are going to go around the room. Um, and uh, I'd like to start things off by asking a really simple question that I've been wanting to ask you since I uh, discovered your mailer work, uh, which is, I'm curious what led you to the discovery at a pretty late moment in your career, like right around 2000. Yeah. 2001 to something like that. What led you to discover that you, first of all, could take your artwork and destroy it? Mm -hmm. not, not really, but you know what I mean, fold it up, and then get past all of this, uh, this stuff about the preciousness of the object, which really, uh, I can tell you, as somebody that's worked at a museum for far, far too long, uh, mm -hmm. is uh, at the heart of most of the expense and the, the difficulty of being in a museum. We're really careful about sending things. Mm -hmm. um, customs paperwork, uh, the packaging, all of this. And uh, when you entered into mail art, uh, you entered into a whole new world. Yeah. For example, I always imagine what it's like to get one of your pictures mm -hmm. and to, to rip it open and unfold it yeah. and look at it. Yeah. How, how did you think about it? And, uh, and uh, it's become a really persistent part of yeah. your practice. I mean, it, it, all, it all started um, um, just by, um, kind, not, not exactly by chance, but um, it, was, it was just, uh, it was my friend, John Goodwin, here in, Montre in Toronto, who uh, asked me to fold up and, and mail. I was showing my first film, 50 Minutes, at his gallery, and he wanted to make a little poster, and he said, why don't you just shoot some frame grabs from the film and um, make, you know, make photographs exactly the same size as the poster, fold them up, and mail them to me, and, uh, and I'll, I'll make the poster directly from the image. And 
I think I sent him maybe you know a dozen or so, 15. He picked one for the little poster and, um, and then made the others into a grid and showed them in the gallery. And then a few years later, I, I was in Paris. I had one of the studios there, and I was asked to be in a, in a group show in New York. And I was there making, I was there making a video. I had um, you know, decided to take a break from photography to, to write and, and work with the moving image. And I got, and I remembered what I had done for John, and I proposed to the gallery to, to do that, to just take some pictures, fold them up, and mail them, and they would just assemble them in, uh, in the gallery. And so that's basically, that's basically how it happened. But yeah, in terms of, uh, yeah, I, had, I guess I had just started to feel, um, I don't know what. I, I felt like I had I had reached an impasse with photography. I wanted to take a break. I really wanted to write. 9/11 uh, had happened. I wanted to make a video, and uh, and I so I did just that. I I, um, I took a break, and it was by um, by starting to you know this very hands-on approach with the photograph again that that kind of. Um, you know, brought back my interest in, in taking pictures because by using this, you know, this new method of, of transmission, I found that I could take pictures of almost anything. And, and, um, and by, you know, putting them through this process and showing them in this manner without any of, like, the accoutrement of traditional photography, framing and matting and and of you know completely bypassing crating and shipping that it was uh, it was just totally liberating and um, and it yeah it just kind of opened uh, it it opened I felt open to photography again wonderful yeah anybody have any questions one back there Talking into a microphone, I guess I don't have to stand because I don't have to yell. Um, I wondered in your videos, um, do you have a script when you when you read? I was just wondering about your your like tone of voice. I find it really interesting. Yeah, no, I've I've written a script and I and I've pre-recorded it and I'm speaking what I hear in the ear in a like a little earbud. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Yeah. One back here. In uh, the book that's been published, there's a correspondence with you and Ben Lerner, the author. Uh, great, great writer. Can you talk about your relationship with him and maybe some of some similarities I find with the aesthetic of your photos and some of the photos in uh, Leaving the Atocha Station? Sorry, what was the last part? So he's got little kind of photos through... Uh, leaving the Atocha Station, his novel of um, different objects uh, throughout, and, and art. Uh, is there any kind of similarity between, or some inspiration between the two of you, or is that just totally a coincidence? To be honest, you just re I had completely forgotten the photographs in, uh, in, that, in that novel. You just reminded me. Now, um, no, I had, you know, I had just read um, that book in 1004, and I, um, and I was, yeah, and I was really interested in, in his style of writing, his, uh, his version of autofiction, I guess, and, uh, and so, it, yeah, it wasn't so much his um, writing about photographs that, uh, that, um, that grabbed me, it was, it was, um, it was more that, you know, just the style of writing, you know, the style of writing and in general. And, um, and I contacted him. I asked him if he'd be interested in writing something for the book. It turned out he, he didn't have a lot of time, but we decided to do this uh, uh, email correspondence instead. And, um, and that, that ended up being, um, being really, really... Um, really fun and gratifying 
process to do with him. And we just, we talk about all kinds of things um, in, in that conversation, yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank all of you for coming. Thank you, Moira, thank you. for a wonderful thank talk. You. Thank you. Okay, good.